Now we're going to discuss salt-cooled uh, fission and fusion reactors, synergism for the rapid development of fly salt technology. I should mention I could not have given this talk three years ago because of new technologies in fusion, nothing to do with fission per se. Technology advances have resulted in salt-cooled fission and fusion machines using the same coolant. Fly salt, that implies massive technological overlap and it creates very large economic and technical and schedule incentives for joint fission fusion technology development programs and common supply chains. And so the discussion is the coupling of fission and fusion salt technology, potential game changer. ARC, with its affordable, robust, compact fusion, and the fluoride salt-cooled high temperature reactor use the same coolant, flybe salt, lithium beryllium fluoride salt. And this is what creates a new synergism. Uh, this particular fusion concept is being developed by Commonwealth Fusion. They are up to about 100 employees. Their initial funding trough was about 100 some million dollars. So they're accelerating very, very, very rapidly. The fluoride salt cooled reactor is being developed by uh, Kairos Power, uh, roughly the same size organization. Needless to say, this goes beyond just pure fly salt. It also applies to much of this applies to molten salt reactors where you have fuel in the coolant. So it's a much broader, broader perspective than the more narrow perspective I've given here. Uh, the salt we're talking about is the one on the first line, live salt, melting point about 460 Celsius. Physical properties a little bit better than water. Operating range 550 to about 700 C for most proposed concepts. Let me start with arc fusion and the liquid fly salt blanket. In terms of Fusion physics, this is a magnetic fusion device, tokamak, nothing new in the physics. What is different is it has a fly salt blanket that I'll get to and the fly salt itself. Now, why a new fusion concept? The development of rare earth barium copper oxide superconducting magnets is changing fusion futures. Most important observation. In the last five years, methods have been developed to manufacture Repco superconducting tape. Now, this particular superconductor has been around for decades, if you want to buy five grams of it. <laughs> what happened is a manufacturer learned how to put it on a thin layer of tape, of steel tape. And of course, what's important about this is it's a manufacturing method. It has to be on steel because of the magnetic forces in a large magnet. So what he developed is a way to make a superconducting magnet using this particular material. Their goal initially was for magnetic resonance machines used by hospitals, Siemens, GE. Uh, the fusion community then noticed, gee, that's a really interesting material. Now, what this particular new material allows is doubling of the magnetic field before bad things happen. And it turns out the size of a magnetic fusion system for any given power output varies as one over the fourth power of the magnetic field. One over the fourth power. In other words, higher magnetic fields can shrink fusion system size by an order of magnitude, more than a factor of 10. Now, this is all because somebody learned how to make something on a manufacturing scale. <laughs> it wasn't a breakthrough in science. It was a breakthrough in technology. By increasing the power density by a factor of 10 has one other little implication. The power density in the fusion blanket increases by an order of magnitude. And if they had problems cooling a solid blanket, you run up the power density by a factor of 10 and you're having a really bad day. And so the story here is manufacturer, superconductor, run up the power density, solid blanket looks like it might become a liquid blanket, whether that's your design goal or not. But it starts out with a manufacturing revolution. It's not a science revolution. Now the liquid fly salt blanket meets the four fusion blanket requirements. It converts 14 MeV neutrons into heat. You breed tritium, fusion fuel for, uh, from lithium. You shield the external components, that means the magnets, and you cool the plasma first wall. And it's a big tank of flybe with about a meter of space, which is required to get the radiation 
fields down so the magnets don't get fried in the most literal sense. Repco uh, Fusion favors fly blankets. There have been many fusion blanket systems that have been proposed, some of them partly developed. Uh, the higher power densities in the blanket make it difficult to cool solid blankets. The higher magnetic fields create large incentives to have a coolant with a low electrical conductivity to avoid coolant magnet field interactions. The main competitor here is lithium lead metal. And of course, that's highly conductive and pumping that across a magnetic field starts consuming a lot of energy if you just moved up the magnetic field by an order of magnitude. And it's that combination of events that there is now an interest in liquid fly blankets. It all follows from a fellow learned how to make superconducting tape with really great properties. Why fly salt? Most fundamental level, maximize tritium production. These salts will have probably about a 90% lithium-6 to produce sufficient tritium for a self-sustaining fusion reaction. This is a big issue in the fusion community. How to make enough tritium have to be self-sufficient. And that's a real challenge. Now, the reason for FLIB is it has beryllium in it. And it turns out there's an N to N reaction that generates more neutrons. You have high energy neutrons, hits a beryllium atom, you get two neutrons. Second, of course, lithium plus a neutron yields tritium. So this is a particular case where the choice of FLIB is based on reactor physics. We need the tritium. Now, it turns out it's also an excellent heat transfer agent compared to other salts, but the initial driver is fusion reactor physics. Now, FLIB salt fusion blankets are applicable to all fusion technologies. ARC is the first design using the new superconducting magnets. It is likely that other fusion systems will follow because of the same rationale. So we're talking about new material a couple of years later first concept for fusion based on the new material and going forward. But we would expect that many other fusion programs are going to take a very hard look at this magnetic material for the same exact reasons. Case study of a change in technology. A second observation, of course, is that the FHR with, uses fly salt and uh, pebble bed. I think many of you know about it. This is a pebble bed salt-cooled reactor, same fuel as used in HTGRs, except you have fly salt. Of course, you need the coolant because it has high performance capabilities. You can roughly increase the power density over an HTGR by a factor of 10 by going to a, a liquid coolant. And of course, the fuel is the HTGR coated particle fuel noted for its high temperature capabilities. Now, the basis of choosing fly salt for an FHR coolant, uh, first and most important one is that fluoride salts are compatible with graphite matrix coated particle fuels. It's a chemical issue. Second, fluoride salts enable low pressure operation. Fly boils at about 1400 C. And third, among fluoride salts, fly has the best coolant properties in terms of heat transfer, neutronics with low parasitic uh, neutron absorption, and the capability to dissolve fission products if failed fuel. They do require uh, high purity lithium-7 to minimize tritium production. So, you know, on a fission side, everything is done to minimize tritium production on the fusion side, absolutely everything is done to maximize tritium production or the system will not work. It's really elementary. <laughs> now, I want to briefly mention the market basis for all salt systems. Higher temperature delivered heat to the power cycle. I show water, sodium, helium, and salt. The inlet temperatures, the outlet temperatures. And in the last column, the average temperature of delivered heat, which for water systems is about 280C, for sodium about 500, for helium about 550. Helium has a high peak temperature, but the helium going into the core is at a relatively low temperature. Salt systems have an average temperature of delivered heat of 650 Celsius, and that has a very large implication in terms of economics on a salt system versus any other system. And, you know, this is strictly a characteristic of salt. It's not a characteristic of fission or fusion or molten salt or whether it's a molten salt chloride system. It's independent of all of those characteristics. And, of course, there's specific reasons for the FHR with fly salt. You have a high temperature fuel failure temperature. You have a low pressure salt. And, of course, if you have failure in uh, a uh, FHR, what you've converted it into is a molten salt reactor where you've dissolved the fission products in the fuel. So it's a great backup safety mechanism. 
And last, of course, limited chemical reactions with air or water. Now, what does this mean going forward? What it implies is very, very large synergisms between fly salt cooled fission and fusion reactors. Obviously, the same concerns, same issues for the, um, in terms of the basic sciences of the salts, such as thermodynamics. Exactly the same questions. Same design tools in many respects. Thermal hydraulics, instrumentation, CAD systems, a lot of commonality. Uh, technology, same materials issues. A little higher neutron flux, a lot of high energy neutrons, but a lot of the same issues, particularly in heat exchangers. Tritium control. Now, this is important to remember that the fusion system has a thousand times as much tritium. So it has a little bit greater tritium control problem than the fission people have. Three orders of magnitude is important. <laughs> Salt purification. Uh, this is an issue. Uh, when you have 14 MeV neutrons wandering around in fly salt, you know, it's going to splatter them into all sorts of interesting things that you did not want to see in your salt. So you have to have chemistry control. You have to remove certain impurities that build up in the salt. If you have corrosion products from your heat exchanger going through that 14 MeV uh, neutron blast, you're going to see some interesting chemical species. So you, have, you do have a salt cleanup system that you have to address. And many of the same issues. There's some specialty concerns, but many of the same identical issues. And of course, power cycles, because it's, you know, it's a salt. Last, and I think perhaps most important in the long term, is the supply chain in terms of equipment. You know, it's one thing if you're developing a pump and you could go to the pump manufacturer and say, oh, I'd like to buy a pump. Uh, it could take me a lot of time. I've charged a lot of money. That doesn't look like a great market. On the other hand, if the pump supplier recognizes there might be two or three or four or five customers, suddenly his enthusiasm for helping you develop a pump for one of these salts is going to be substantially greater. So the supply chain is a big thing. Of course, Flybe Salt, the same Flybe Salt, same identical supply chain. And of course, lithium isotopic separation, same problem, except the fission guys want the lithium-7 and the fusion guys want the lithium-6. But what you see here is this commonality of problems, commonality of challenges, commonality of opportunities. And I think that's the really important message here that we're going to begin to see, I think, from the fusion community over the next decade, pouring increased resources in this specific area where there's a lot of chances for cooperation between the two communities. Major salt players today, of course, Kairos, uh, the Department of Energy, NE Fusion, uh, EERE, that's the, I didn't go, go into the discussion of this. It turns out that our solar, concentrated solar power people are, want to build the next generation of uh, solar power towers using a chloride salt that operates at about 700 C, a sodium, a potassium, magnesium salt, and it turns out the chemistry and other factors results in a lot of overlap between the CSP people and the fusion guys and the fission guys. Now, their catch is they want to build it in the next five years. And that means they're going to have to have a pump that, oh, well, let's see, what's the height of that tower? Oh, it's about 300 feet. It's going to be a high lift pump. So there's some other people out there who have a sudden interest in high pressure drop pumps <laughs> for, for salts that are under chemically reducing conditions. Many universities, MIT, of course, were doing salt or radiations, as I'm sure you're well aware of. Wisconsin with fly loops, corrosion loops, and lots of other universities in various areas. And of course, there's a growing effort overseas, SINAP in China. There's ongoing work in the United Kingdom and in the European uh, community. So what we're beginning to see is a rapidly expanding community, both on the fission side and on the solar side and on the fusion side with lots and lots of overlap of technology. The synergisms can accelerate the development of all salt systems. And so the next step is the strategy to maximize benefits of cooperation. I'm just going to stop there and uh, open it to any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Raul Johnson from uh, Muons Incorporated. Uh, there's one advantage of the uh, YBCO or rare earth uh, 
uh, superconductor that I think is actually uh, put on Hastelloy at times. Yes. Uh, and it's very strong. Uh, one thing that uh, you can also add to your list of advantages is it's very radiation resistant. Yes. And, it's, uh, and we've actually done an SBIR program studying that for that purpose. But most importantly, it allows doubling the magnetic field for the fusion guys. That's the, that's the thing that really sets it apart from the other superconductors. I also wanted to, to comment about uh, the use of uh, um, the lithium in uh, a fission reactor. Yes. We are actually are looking at using a, a natural uh, isotope ratio of lithium in the, in the molten salt that we'd like to use to make tritium for the NNSA. Yep. So there's another possibility. I won't go into the defense applications, of which there are obviously many. <laughs> That's a separate community. But I'm sure they're keeping notes. <laughs> There'll be some papers out on this. If you have any interest, uh, send me an email, and I'll be happy to send you a currently the four-pager we have on this. There'll be some more detailed papers out. In addition, you can go to the Commonwealth Fusion website, and they'll, they'll provide you lots more information on... Uh, what's happening in the fusion side. But as I say, uh, my guess is within about three or four years, you may have a session on fusion salt systems, maybe three years. Thank you very much.